the worse your handwriting got. At least that's the way it was with me. And Jesus, though, is our example. He's the one that we are to pattern our lives after. And uh, the study this evening is entitled, Walking in the Steps of Jesus. And I want us to look at some statements or some ideas in reference to walking in the steps of Jesus as to how we can walk more closely like him. In the first place, Jesus' steps lead us to the waters of baptism. If you go over in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17, we read there that when Jesus was come to Galilee, come from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him, John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said, Suffer it to be so now, or allow it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he suffered him. That is, he allowed him. And when Jesus was baptized, he went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened, and the Spirit of God descended in the form of a dove and lit upon him. And lo, from heaven there also came a voice saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, in studying the baptism of John, we know that it was for the remission of sins. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 4, we read there that, that John did preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. It was in order to receive the remission of sins. It's the very same expression in the Greek as in the English that we have in Acts 2.38, for the remission of sins, in order to receive the remission of sins. But Jesus had no sin. He was without sin. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 says that he was without sin, as well as 2 Corinthians 5 and 21. So why would Jesus have to be baptized? Well, he tells us in the text, he tells us, uh, let us, let us fulfill all righteousness, uh, suffer it to be so now, allow it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. We read in our Bibles in Psalm 119 in verse 172 that all thy commandments are righteousness. Therefore, Jesus was being baptized because it was a command of all Jews at that time to be baptized in preparation for the coming of the kingdom. Now, they had to be baptized for the remission of their sins, but Jesus is the exception. But he did it because it was a command of God. And yet, when you think about it, what command of God for us today is not necessary for salvation? I remember one time talking with a, a Baptist who said, well, baptism is just a, a command. Oh, well, I said, yes, it is. It is a command. But can you tell me a command that's not necessary for salvation? Hebrews 5, 8 and 9 says, For though he were son, yet learned the obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. So baptism is uh, necessary because it's a command of God. But Jesus is the exception in reference to the purpose of his being baptized. It was simply a command, and he was fulfilling all righteousness, as the text tells us. But if we're going to walk in the steps of Jesus, then we ought to submit to baptism as he did. The Bible teaches us in Mark 16, 16, Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. In Acts 2, 38, Peter said to them, When they asked the question, Men and brethren, what shall we do? He said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. In Acts 22 and 16, Saul of Tarsus was told by Ananias, And now why tearest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And in 1 Peter 3, 21, Peter says, The like figure, whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so these passages, as well as others, emphasize the necessity for us to be baptized. And if we're going to walk in the steps of Jesus, the steps of Jesus lead us to the waters of baptism. The steps of Jesus also lead us through the wilderness of temptation. In the very next chapter of Matthew, Matthew chapter 4, we read that Jesus was led of the Spirit, Luke's account tells us, into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Jesus 
fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. He was hungry. And the Bible tells us that the devil took him to the, uh, or showed him the stones and said, uh, if thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Well now, if you're hungry and you had the power to turn stones into bread, would you do it? Jesus, of course, had the power to do that, but he quoted from the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 13. He said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The devil then took him to the pinnacle of the temple, the high point on the temple, and said, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, that his angels will take charge of thee, and thou will not dash thy foot against a stone. The angels will lift you up. That's not a, ver a quote verbatim from me, but that's from Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12, I believe. But the devil knows scripture, and that shows the importance of our knowing the scriptures. But Jesus answered him. Jesus said, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. This emphasizes the fact that the Bible is in complete harmony with itself. And uh, the passage that the devil used on that occasion, he misused it. And so Jesus pointed that out to him that uh, by his uh, calling upon Jesus to cast himself down, that Jesus would be tempting God. And so Jesus said, thou shalt not tempt the, the Lord thy God. And so he refused to do that. But again, he answered with scripture. And then, of course, he uh, was taken to a high mountain and shown all the kingdoms of the world and the glory thereof. And the devil said to him then, If thou be the Son of God, then fall down and worship me, and I'll give you all these kingdoms. And Jesus said, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou, thou serve. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 13. Each time our Lord answered the devil with scripture. So it must be with us when the devil tempts us. Now Jesus was tempted. It's not a sin to be tempted. Every man is tempted. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 13 says every man is tempted. And when he is drawn away, uh, rather James tells us that uh, every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And lust when that's conceived bringing forth sin and sin, when it is finished, bringing forth death. But in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, Paul said there, there is no temptation uh, taking you that is, is common to man. Uh, there's nothing that will come upon you that is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you're able, but also will with the temptation uh, leave a way of escape. And, and Paul, uh, to read it correctly, he says, there had no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. Common to man. All men are tempted. Jesus was tempted, but he didn't yield to the temptation. So when temptation comes our way, let us look to Jesus as our example for how to uh, avoid yielding to temptation. Well, how did he do it? He did it with scripture. The psalmist said, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. When God's word is in our heart, we can fight off the devil. And that is what we're to use to fight the devil off, the word of God. Ephesians 6, 17 says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Earlier he says, And take the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And so God's word is able to uh, repel and is able to fight off the temptations that come our way. That shows the importance of studying the Bible. That shows the importance of our uh, filling our hearts with the word of God. James says, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness and grafted word which is able to save your soul. And so God's word is able to help us fight the devil off just as Jesus used the word of God to uh, avoid sinning himself. And he could have sinned. He had the ability to sin just as anyone because he was a man. Yes, he was God, but he was also a man as much as anyone here is today. He had all the characteristics of a human. And so he could have sinned, but he did not. But the footsteps of Jesus will also lead us to the house of worship. 
If you have your Bibles, look over in Luke chapter 4 and in verse 16. In Luke chapter 4 and verse 16, Jesus is going back to his hometown. He grew up in Nazareth. And the Bible says, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. It was our Lord's custom to go in to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Keep in mind, he lived under the old law. Galatians 4 and verse 4 says, In the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law. Jesus was born, he lived, and died under the law of Moses. And therefore, being a Jew, he was obligated to obey the law of Moses, which included the Sabbath day. And every Sabbath, Jesus was at the synagogue. Every Sabbath, Jesus was worshiping, was observing what was required under the law. And so when we think about walking in the footsteps of Jesus, his steps lead us to the house of worship. The enemies could find no fault in him in John chapter 8 and in verse 46. If they could have found this fault, that is, that he did not uh, go to the synagogue and he did not observe the Sabbath as he should have, then they could have uh, brought that out against him. They They could have used that charge against him, but they could not. If we're going to walk in the steps of Jesus in a figuratively, figurative sense, Jesus is here. Jesus is in our midst. Think with me of some passages along this line. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 16, a passage that relates to the Lord's Supper. The cup which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the uh, communion of the body of Christ? The word communion means fellowship. It's the word for fellowship. It's the word that means joint participation. And so when we're partaking of the Lord's Supper, Jesus, in a figurative sense, is partaking of it with us. In Matthew 26, 28 and 29, Jesus said, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many, for the remission of sins. And he says, I will not drink henceforth this fruit of the vine until I drink it new in uh, in the kingdom with you. Uh, And so Jesus is partaking of the Lord's Supper, his supper, with us when we partake of it. And so why would members of the church not want to be in the assembly on the Lord's Day to observe the Lord's Supper, and to be with Jesus. He's here. He's worshiping with us, in a sense. I mean, he, we are worshiping him, of course, but he, he, in a sense, is a participant. We don't look at it that way often. We often, and I've heard it said, that we are not spectators, uh, but uh, we are to be participants, and that's true. And Jesus is not just a spectator either, in a sense. He's a participant because communion indicates joint participation. And a verse that's often used in reference to the fact that the Lord is here, uh, Matthew chapter 18 and verse 20, I think the principle is true, though the context is dealing with discipline, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. The principle is so that Jesus is here. If Jesus were to come back to this earth today, and the Bible doesn't tell us that he'll ever set foot on this earth, but if he were, where do you think he'd be on Sunday night? Where do you think he'd be on Sunday morning? Where do you think he would be during the gospel meeting? Don't you think he'd be meeting with the saints, those that are of his body? And so Jesus' steps need to be observed in uh, his going to the house of worship, And you and I need to see the value of it as well. And to walk more closely in the footsteps of Jesus. I like the psalmist's words in Psalm 122 and verse 1. When David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. What a wonderful thought that is, that the Lord is here. And the psalmist wanted to be with the Lord in that old system, under that old uh, covenant. But you and I are under a better covenant, with better promises, with a better hope. Why not assemble with the saints in the house of the Lord? And then to walk closely in the steps of Jesus, 
will be uh, such that we will uh, be led into fields of service. To walk in the steps of Jesus means to be led into the fields of service. Jesus did not come to be served. He came to serve. And you and I need to have a servant's attitude about the Lord's church. Not what can others do for me, but what can I do for others? How can I serve others? When we think about Jesus, a very short biography is found in one verse. In Acts 10 and verse 38, when Peter said, He went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed to the devil. Jesus came to the sick to heal them. He came to the lost to save them. He came to sinners to rescue them. Luke 19 and verse 10 says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. In Matthew chapter 20, the disciples were angry with James and John because they, through their mother or their mother through them, asked that they be given the right and left hand in the kingdom. And Jesus said, it's not mine to give. And he went on to say, are you willing to be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? You see, they were thinking of a material kingdom, an earthly kingdom. Jesus came to establish a spiritual kingdom. And they had the wrong concept. Even after his resurrection, they still didn't understand. For we read in uh, Acts chapter 1 where they said, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? They didn't understand. Jesus was patient with them. But the disciples were arguing over the fact that James and John wanted the left and the right hand in the kingdom. And Jesus said in verse 28 of chapter 20, For the Son of Man came not to be served, not to serve, not to be served, but to be served, not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus came to serve. And you and I are servants, are to be servants of the Lord. In Romans chapter 6, verse 16, beginning, the Apostle Paul said there, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. And so we are servants. The Apostle Paul often in his writings referred to himself as being a servant, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, and so are we. We're servants of Jesus Christ. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1, Be ye therefore followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Christ came to be served. You know, sometimes there are those in the church who get upset because no one has come to see them. Maybe, maybe they're in the hospital and uh, no one has come to see them. Or maybe they're at home and not able to get out and no one calls or no one sends cards or no one uh, uh, goes by to see them. And they get their feelings hurt and so they just quit. Well, that's not the right attitude to have. And you and I ought to try to visit those that are sick and visit those that are in the hospital and those that are uh, in nursing homes and are unable to get out. But I wonder sometimes if those individuals who complained about that when they were able to get out, when they were uh, able body and could get out and go as they please, who did they visit? What funeral home did they go to when someone passed away to pay their respects? I like uh, Yogi Bear's, you know, Yogi Bear has some uh, funny sayings. I don't know if most of the older people may remember Yogi Bear. He was uh, catcher for the New York Yankees, but he would say some funny things. And one of the things that he, he said, and I've got it down somewhere, it's uh, this. He said, if you don't go to other people's funeral, they won't go to yours. Now think about that for a little bit. But uh, uh, the point is, you and I need to visit. And you and I need to recognize that we're servants of Jesus Christ and not have the attitude what can others do for me, but what can I do for the Lord? What can I do for the Lord? In 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 15, the Apostle Paul had a wonderful attitude. 
He said, I very gladly spend and be spent uh, for you. And the Apostle Paul, there was no one more dedicated to the cause of Christ than he. But his attitude was he was willing to spend and be spent for the cause of Christ at Corinth. To walk in the steps of Jesus is also uh, necessary in reference to another area. No one can follow the footsteps of Jesus unless he goes into the mountain of prayer. Jesus prayed a great deal. Just to look at a few passages with me, look in your Bibles at Luke chapter 6 and verse 12. Right before Jesus appointed his apostles, the text tells us, And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Imagine that. Here is the Son of God. Here is the one that was in the bosom of the Father who saw the need to pray, and he prayed all night knowing the importance of the selecting of these men to be his apostles. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 35, Mark records, And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. That's Jesus. He got up early in the morning, go, and he went out into a solitary place to pray. Again, in our Bibles, in Matthew chapter 14, when the multitudes were following uh, Jesus, he sent them away. But first he sent his disciples across the Sea of Galilee, and then he turned to send the multitude away. In Matthew chapter 14, verses 23 and 24, we read, And when he had sent the multitude away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. That's verse 23. Jesus spent time in prayer. And he calls upon you and me to do the same. If we're going to walk in the steps of Jesus, we need to see the importance of prayer and to follow him in reference to his pray praying. Consider with me a few passages. In Luke chapter 18 and verse 1, Jesus told this parable. Here's the purpose that he told this parable. That men ought always to pray and not to faint. It's interesting that after he tells that parable, he then mentions, he asks the question, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Prayer and faith go hand in hand. One who has a weak faith is one who doesn't pray very much. Now, faith doesn't come by prayer, but our faith may be an indication of how much we pray. Our prayers may be an indication of how strong our faith is. We read in our Bibles in Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so we need to spend time in prayer. Think of it. We have this great power within our grasp, this great blessing of prayer, and yet do we use it as we ought to? I can certainly say that I need to pray more, and I'm sure you can say the same thing. The Jews pray at least three times a day, and it wasn't just in reference to meals. We need to spend time in prayer. We need to go to our closets and pray. We need to go to a solitary place and pray. Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 7, beginning, Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Uh, what man is there of you, if his son asked uh, for bread, would he give him a stone? Or if he asked for a fish, would he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give good things to them that ask him? You know, sometimes we don't have because we fail to ask. James says you have not because you ask not. And then sometimes what we're asking for is out of selfish reasons. 
And James went on to say, and you receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts. And so to walk in the footsteps of Jesus means that we will follow him, so to speak, to the mountain of prayer and spend time in prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 says, pray without ceasing. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 2 says, continue in prayer. Acts 12 and verse 5 speaks there of uh, the fact that the church was praying on behalf of Peter. In Acts chapter 2 and 42, it says, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. James 5, 16 says, confess your faults to one another and pray one for another that you may be healed. Now watch it. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You say, I don't know that it does any good. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elijah was a man such as like passions as are we. And he prayed that it might not rain. It rained not for a space of three years and six months. And he prayed again. And the earth of the heavens brought forth rain. And the earth brought forth fruit. What's the point? Elijah was a man just like we are. And he prayed and God heard his prayers. And if God heard his prayers, he will hear our prayers if we're in Christ. John 9, 31, Jesus, of course, is in conversation with the Jews. And on this occasion, the blind man was speaking to the Jews. And he said, we know that God heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of him and do his will, him he heareth. If any man be a worshiper of him and do his will, him he heareth. And 1 Peter 3, 12 says, The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. How much time do you spend in prayer? But to walk in the steps of Jesus means we will follow him even to the garden of depression. Jesus' steps led him through the garden of depression. Think about it. One of his own betrayed him. Mine own familiar friend whom I trusted hath lifted up his heel against me, he said. Another one denied him three times. All of them forsook him. Jesus was depressed. As his apostles slept, the Bible tells us his sweat was as it were drops of blood. Look in Luke chapter 22, beginning in verse 39. Luke chapter 22, beginning in verse 39. And he came out and went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said to them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And if you read the parallel passage in Matthew 26, notice with me verses 38 through uh, 40. The words there as Matthew records them. Matthew 26, beginning with verse 38. In the garden of Gethsemane. Verse 36. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane. And saith unto the disciples. Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. And began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them. My soul. Here it is. My soul is exceeding sorrowful. Even unto death. Tear ye here and watch with me. And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Now someone might think, well, is that a contradiction? You have Luke's account says where he was on his knees. And here Matthew's account says he was on his face. Well, there's no contradiction. He fell to his knees and then he fell to his face. And his soul was exceedingly sorrowful, the text tells us. As his apostles slept, his sweat was, as it were, drops of blood as he prayed. Now, it wasn't. They weren't drops of blood, but as they were, 
as if it were drops of blood is what the text tells us. When we get depressed, when friends and family forsake us, Christ will still be there if we're following him. The psalmist said in Psalm 27 and verse 10 that when my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will lift me up. When those who are closest to us forsake us, the Lord will lift us up. And no one could be more depressed than was Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. You think about what loomed ahead for him. In the very shadow of the cross, he knew that all would forsake him. He knew that even his heavenly Father would forsake him because when he was on the cross, he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And that was, of course, because of the fact that Jesus bore our sins to the cross. And because God does not uh, have anything to do with sin. He, in uh, a figure of speech, turned his back on his son because Jesus bore our sins to the cross. And so a separation came about, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. It wasn't just the pain or knowing of the pain that was going to come upon him physically. It was the mental anguish of knowing that his heavenly father would be separated from him. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6 tells us, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. That passage ought to give us some comfort. And you think about the Apostle Paul in prison, writing his last epistle to Timothy said in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 16, At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray, God, that it may not be laid to their charge. Nevertheless, notwithstanding, he says, the Lord stood with me. If everyone else leaves, the Lord will still, still be with you if you do right. And same with me. And so in times of depression, in times when you're blue, in times when you have the mully grubs, think about what Jesus went through. Think about the suffering that the Apostle Paul went through. And we go through nothing in comparison to what they did. To walk in the steps of Jesus means it will lead to the cross. The steps of Jesus led him to the cross. Hebrews 2 and verse 9, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels, who for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Luke 23 and verse 33 tells us that they came to Calvary and there they crucified him. Jesus was crucified on Calvary between two thieves. It was necessary that he die. You recall in the Garden of Gethsemane when that motley crew or mob came to arrest Jesus Peter pulled out his sword and cut off the high priest's servant's ear and Jesus said put up thy sword he that lives by the sword shall die by the sword and he said thinkest thou not that I could not pray to my heavenly father and he would send more than twelve legions of angels but how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be Jesus knew the scriptures had to be fulfilled. He knew he had to die. And after his resurrection, he said to the apostles, thus it is written, and thus it behooved, meaning necessary, thus it behooved the Christ to suffer and to die and to be raised up. Luke 24, verses 46 and 47, thus it is written, and thus it behooved the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, For he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Yes, it was necessary that he die. But if I'm going to walk in the steps of Jesus, I too, in a sense, must die. 
I must die to sin. I must die to self. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We sing a song. I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given to me? If Jesus were to ask you that question, what would you say? What have I done for Jesus? What, I, what have I given to him? How have I helped out the cause of Christ? And then the steps of Jesus led him to the throne of God. In Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, we read there that he, after his resurrection, he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. That's a reference to the apostles. He was teaching the apostles those last 40 days before he ascended back into heaven. And on that first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ, we read that Peter stood up and he said in Acts 2, 29, men and brethren, let me freely speak to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried and that his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn to him that of the fruit of his loins according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. And then he went on to say in verse 36, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So the footsteps of Jesus led him to the throne of God. So if we're going to walk in the steps of Jesus, we must be led to the waters of baptism. We must walk with him, and he must walk with us. It's necessary for us to be faithful to him in order for him to walk with us through the wilderness of temptation. His steps led him to the house of worship on a regular basis. His steps led him into fields of service. Jesus came to serve, not to be served. Jesus' steps led him to the mountain of prayer. His steps led him through the garden of depression. And his steps led him to the cross. Oh, how heavy those steps must have been. But he went to the cross. He recognized his obligation. A little headache, a little bit of pain, did not keep him from going to the cross. And then his steps led him to the throne of God. And if we walk in the steps of Jesus, then we will be baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins. We will be led to uh, the house of worship and we will attend regularly. We will be led into fields of service where we can be useful in the Lord's kingdom. We will be led to give our lives to the Lord as he gave his for us. We will be led to spend time in prayer. And if, our, if we're faithful to the Lord, one day we'll hear the words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter down into the joys of thy Lord, and we'll be in the throne room of God forever and ever. Won't that be wonderful? To be in heaven. To be with the righteous of all the ages. To be with God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the angels, and all the righteous, Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, and David, and Daniel, and on and on we could go. Won't that be wonderful? But we have to be right with the Lord. And we have to be obedient to him. We have to walk in his steps. If you're here and you're not a Christian, we encourage you to obey. If you're a child of God but you've been unfaithful, we encourage you to repent and come back. While together we stand and sing.